This month, we are going through our Armor of God series, Equipped. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 14 through 18, it says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, uh, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, it says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplications for all of the saints. Appreciate the messages that we've heard so far. They've been excellent. Uh, and if you haven't heard any of them, I recommend that you go back to YouTube or Facebook and, and look them up because... Uh, we need the armor of God in this day and age. Uh, the things that we're facing, the struggles that uh, the enemy would want to attack us with. Uh, how many know that God has not left us as orphans, the Bible says? A few weeks ago, uh, my wife and I, after a Sunday uh, service, uh, we had our little grandson, and we needed to give my daughter, who's studying down in San Diego, some paperwork. So we said, well, let's meet in the middle, and we met at Ocean, in Oceanside. And if you have ever been to Oceanside, you know that it's the home of the United States Marine Corps. Camp Pendleton is located there. So when you walk around Oceanside, you see Marines. You see Marine flags. You see men and women that are Marines. Uh, my daughter was saying that after we left, uh, her, a, a friend of hers, they went to the movies there, and this busload of Marines pulled up, and they all pulled out. Uh, my brother and my dad are both Marines. Thank you for your service, if you guys are watching. And one thing is about Marines, though, is you never hear a Marine say, I'm a ex-Marine, I'm a former Marine. To them, that's no such thing. It's once a Marine, always a Marine. See, you know. And the Marines, they live by this, this motto, this creed, and that creed is Semper Fidelis. Semper Fidelis. It's Latin, and it means always faithful. I went on their website, and it says concerning Semper Fidelis, it says it is the fighting spirit of every Marine that can make the promise to win our nation's battles. The promise is proclaimed in our motto, Semper Fidelis, and it means that we are always faithful to those on our left and to those on our right. Uh, for our, uh, uh, from our fellow Marines, we fight alongside to those communities for which we fight. They said that uh, of the Marines, they are either your greatest ally or your worst enemy. Hoorah. And I bring this up. Because whether you know it or not, we have been enlisted into the army of the Lord. Whether you are five years old uh, or 75 years old, uh, the, the moment you commit your life to Jesus Christ, uh, you are now enlisted as a soldier in the army of the Lord, and you're on a battlefield. And everybody's on a different battlefield. And just like the Marines, Semper Fidelis, uh, we need to always be faithful, always ready, always faithful. Faithful to serve God. Faithful to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, faithful to the things of God. Faithful to answer his call. Faithful to do the work of the Lord. Uh, faithful to remain on the battlefield. Faithful that when he would call upon you, you would be ready. Whatever it is that he might ask of you, whether it's to pray for someone that uh, you know is going through it, whether it's to, to give uh, to the mission field, uh, whether it's to fast, uh, whether it's to teach a Bible study, whatever the case might be, that we would be faithful, ready, semper fidelis. The battlefields that some of us are on today, they vary, but we all are on a battlefield. For some of us, it might be physical. It might be battling sickness or disease. It might be wrestling with, with uh, an affliction. It might be uh, something... Uh, mental. It might be the head trips that we all go through at some point. It might be those thoughts that the enemy would try to plant into your mind. Uh, it might be a financial battlefield tonight, but understand whether it's physical or mental or financial, every single battle that we, are on, that we face or in every battlefield that we are on is always going to be spiritual. 
We are spiritual beings. It's not just that you got sick, but the devil's a liar. In the book of Ephesians 6.12, it says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And the apostle Paul, he understood the nature of our battle. He understood what it meant to be on a battlefield, whether it was a physical battlefield or, or a, a spiritual battlefield. He understood what it meant to be a soldier for Christ. He was chained up to Roman soldiers, and, and as he was chained up to these soldiers, uh, he began to look at the different pieces that made up their armor. And he began to liken them to us spiritually, the armor that we wear, the armor that we're, we are equipped with. We've gone over truth and righteousness. We've gone over faith. Last week, uh, uh, Pastor Dan was, was uh, going over peace and preparing for the Lord's return. When he said that, that, that struck out to me. He says, we need to prepare for the Lord's return. In other words, not to be caught off guard, but to be ready, anticipating him, doing the work of the Lord, being found faithful, because he can come back at any moment. And so tonight, what we're going to go over is the helmet of salvation. And I've entitled this message, Helmets Save Lives. Any helmet that we would wear primarily has one function, and that's to guard the head. Whether it's a, a helmet worn in sports or, or whether a helmet uh, worn on a construction site. If you ride a motorcycle in the state of California, you're mandated to wear a helmet. Uh, when I was, I was looking at different pictures of helmets going over this, and I saw a motorcycle helmet, and I thought about this, this story that Pastor Bernie told about uh, he was on a motorcycle, and it was Sister Elvira and his three kids all on one motorcycle. I love that story. That's what, and I, the reason I love that story so much is because I can relate. My dad, growing up, drove a motorcycle. And we were kids, and this was in the 80s, and sometimes we'd have to go with him to run his errands, uh, or he'd take us to school, and I would be on the back of the motorcycle, and my brother would be just resting on the gas tank, asleep. And this was before helmets. We didn't wear helmets then. So thank God for traveling mercies, even upon the unsaved. Amen. But helmets... They're designed to save lives. They're designed to avoid injury. They're designed to protect the head because the head is one of the most sensitive parts of our body. Our heads, in, uh, under the protection of our skulls, is where our brains are located. And the brain is the command, is the command center of our bodies. It's where thoughts, our senses, uh, how we process things, what we smell and, and, and see, everything that goes through the brain. I was watching this uh, documentary about mountain climbers, the ones that climb these, uh, like Everest and these snowy cap mountains, and, and they were talking about frostbite. And what they were saying was um, that at a certain point, uh, when the temperature drops uh, to a certain level, what the brain will do was it'll begin to restrict the flow of blood to the extremities, to fingers, to toes, your tip of your nose. These are the parts of your body, they end up uh, turning black and falling off because of frostbite. And the reason that the brain does that, the reason that that happens to the body is because the brain is trying to keep the core warm. Because the brain understands, it goes into a protection mode, and the brain understands that it can survive without fingers. It can survive without toes. It can survive without the tip of your nose. But it cannot survive without its heart. It cannot survive without its lungs. And so what the brain will do in order to protect itself uh, and to protect its life is it'll begin to pull back the blood flow and make sure that the uh, core is kept warm. What an awesome thing that the brain knows to automatically do that. We were created by a divine creator, an intelligent uh, divine creator. They say that an average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. It's a lot of thoughts. 
And so that's why it's so important that our minds be covered, especially in the heat of the battle. How we re react to, to trials, how we respond uh, to what's going on around us. It not only just determines our actions and, and what we're going to do next, but it also affects our lives and even the lives of those around us. The book of Proverbs 4.23, it says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. The Bible exhorts us uh, to guard our, ha our hearts, to guard our thoughts, uh, because they're linked uh, to one another, and they often influence one another, and they influence the, the, the decisions that we make. And so the helmet of salvation, what it does, it protects the mind. 1 Thessalonians 5.8, it says, But let us who are of the day be sober. That word sober means watchful. It means vigilant. It means clear-headed. It means to keep awake. And it's saying, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. How many saved people do we have in the house of God tonight? Right? We get saved, and a miracle takes place in our lives. And that miracle is, is that we are no longer estranged from God. We are now in the family of God. That we, if we die, our sins are forgiven, and heaven is our home. When we get saved, our lives change. They change radically. What we used to do, we no longer want to do. There's a new birth that takes place within our lives. Our old destructive habits, we replace them with discipline now in our lives. We speak differently. You know, we don't look at situations and difficulties with despair. Now we look at it with hope and with wisdom, the wisdom of God's word. We understand that. Our minds, they're being renewed. As we study God's word, as we meditate on God's word, as we go into devotionals, our minds are being transformed, they're being changed. The book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22-24, it says that you put off concerning your former conduct. The old man, because we all have an old man, an old woman, that grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. It says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. The Bible says that you are a new creation. And as new creations now, we're to live according to how God intended us to live in righteousness and holiness. Uh, we're intended to worship God in spirit and in truth. It's supposed to change our lives. At salvation, uh, when we come to Christ and ask him to forgive us of our sins, our lives should change. And it should be reflected in how we live our lives. Because we're not just Christians in name only. But we're Christians uh, in lifestyle. We're born-again believers, uh, bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. God's doing a work in our lives. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had the honor and the privilege to speak at the youth uh, and young adults uh, collide. And it was Holy Ghost. Them young people know how to worship God. And them young people, God is doing something in their lives. And I remember we were talking about Esther, what God did in her life and how he raised her up uh, and where she was at and all that she accomplished uh, for such a time as this because of where she was at in place of history. And the calling that God has upon the young men and the young women of this congregation, of this fellowship, uh, that are being raised up for such a time as this. Because whether they know it or not, uh, they are influencing their generation. So we need to pray for them. We need to lift them up in prayer and encourage them. And be mentors to them. Amen. Someone did that for my wife and I when we were young. Someone took us under their wing. Someone mentored us and taught us and loved us and helped us and taught us to pray. And that's how we're here today. It's because someone took the time to be a part of our lives. We need to continue to to continue that, that discipleship. Book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 2. Again, it says, be transformed. It says, do not be conformed to this world. That's key. But be transformed 
by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Someone said concerning the mind and concerning the thoughts that are formed in our minds, it says, your life is a reflection of your thoughts. Be very careful about what you think, for your thoughts run your life. And what consumes your mind will control your life. And that's why the enemy assaults our minds. And that's why he assaults our thought life. Uh, And that's why he tries to afflict our minds. And he'll use fear. He'll use worry, anxiety. He'll use doubt. He'll use stress. Whether it's stress at at, at the job or at school, stress in the home, He'll use stress uh, to try to wear away at your stamina, at your strength. He uses lies and deceptions to attack our minds, our thoughts. You know, look at them, what they're thinking about you. They're not thinking anything about you. But he uses those lies. He uses distractions, carnality, temptations. These are just some of the few fiery darts that the enemy will fire at our minds. And remember that this whole month, uh, the armor of God, what we're talking about is spiritual warfare. Not just little negative thoughts that might flow in and out of our minds, uh, but full-on, all-out assaults that take place on the mi- in the mind. The mind is, is the battlefield oftentimes. And the lies and the condemnation that the enemy would try to assault you with. Uh, well, you call yourself a Christian, but man, look at all the past mistakes you've made. Look at the way you reacted to your spouse. Uh, look at how you just, and you begin to accuse and condemn. You try to give you thoughts of quitting. Just give it up. Walk away. It's not worth it. Stop following Christ. We need to remember to tell the devil, what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. To rebuke the devil. He's a liar. He's the father of all lies. Uh, And tonight in Jesus' name, and if you're suffering, if you're going through some of these assaults, there's healing and there's freedom in Jesus Christ tonight. The same yesterday, today, and forever. He set you free, and he'll do it again. He's got the power tonight to to help us and to strengthen us. In the book of 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 5, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, for casting down arguments, uh, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity, to the obedience of Christ. When the battle gets heavy, the word of God instructs us, bring those thoughts into captivity. Don't let them float around in there. Don't let them them, roam around in there. Don't let them, like the snowball, start off small and then get bigger and bigger, but immediately bring it into captivity. No, devil, that's a lie. Bear, the word of God tells me this. I rebuke that thought right now. It's not of you, O God. The Bible says that we are to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. When we're in the thick of the battle, begin to submit to God in prayer, in worship. Uh, Begin to draw upon the strength that God can give us. Begin to meditate on his word. Sometimes you got to get loud and begin to shout, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke this. Uh, But you got to submit yourself to God. And what happens as you submit to yourself to God, God is pouring himself into you. God is filling you with his spirit, with his anointing, with his authority. The devil has no choice but to flee when you resist him that way. Because of God, it's what he's doing in your life. Resist him and he will flee. These are images of, of, of struggle. My son recently started doing uh, jujitsu, and we went to one of his matches, and I was tired just watching him because it's, it's just nonstop grappling, wrestling. And I'm thinking, like, where does he get the stamina for that? And, uh, and, and that's the picture that the Bible is painting. 
You're going to have to fight, but you're going to win. You're going to be victorious. You might take some lumps, but you're going to be victorious when you're submitted to God. So don't give up. Don't give up. Keep fighting. Stand fast and prayer and fasting. And understand that we aren't meant to be one-man armies. We have, we have pastors. We have leaders. We have pillars in the church. We have faithful brothers and sisters. Uh, you're going through something. Why do you carry it? Give it to God and ask someone else to help carry that burden. Brother, can you help me? I'm going through something. Can you help me pray? Can you help me fast? And that's what we do is we build up and we encourage one another. My brother was telling me that in boot camp, that one of the things that they were taught was, you don't leave anyone behind. And they would wear these heavy packs, and they would have to march. They would have to run for miles. And what my brother told me is what they would, be, they would do, what they were encouraged to do, is if they saw somebody straggling behind, somebody on the left, somebody on the right, and they pick up their pack. They, each guy picks up their pack. Let's go, Marine, and they begin to run, the three of them. And you know what takes place? The load is lightened a little bit on the guy that's struggling, and the, one, and the guys on, on both sides of, of that particular Marine, he says what happens is all of a sudden your weight doesn't feel as heavy anymore either. By you lifting up somebody else's weight, he says, I can't explain it, but your weight seems to be a little bit less. And the three of you are going together in the same direction until that person in the middle is saying, I'm good. I could take it from here. That's the body of Christ. Always faithful. See, no commander in chief will send his soldiers into battle unprepared and ill-equipped. And God, he's given us these mighty weapons of war against the devil. He's given us his word. The same word that Jesus used to rebuke the enemy when he was tempted in the wilderness. Uh, he's given us the sweet name of Jesus. The name above all names, the Bible says. The name that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. The name of Jesus that when demons hear it, they shudder. They're in fear and they have to flee. He's given us that name. The authority that comes in the name of Jesus Christ. He's given us his precious blood. The precious blood of his son that was shed on the cross of Calvary. It's because of that blood that we're saved. We're forgiven. We're healed. We're cleansed. We're delivered. We're, we're made whole because of that precious blood. Ephesians 2.13 it says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We belong to Jesus. He's given us so many blessings. And the devil, at one point in our lives, might have had us deceived. We might have been in rebellion uh, towards God and towards the things of God. Uh, we were robbed of the blessings that God has given us. But God, in his mercy and in his grace, uh, did not spare his son allowed him to go all the way to the cross, to reach out his arms, to die and to rise again on the third day so that we can be saved. We need to stop listening to what the enemy says about us and stop listening to what he calls us and start listening to the word of God and what the, what the word of God says about our lives. If you are of a certain age and had Miss Bowie as your teacher, you know, you know that you were taught who you are in Christ. See, the helmet of salvation identifies us with Christ. We're going to see a couple of uh, pictures right now. And usually when you see a helmet, you can kind of identify what this helmet is, whether it's a sport or military or whatever. So put the first one. Who's that? It's the gladiator. It's the helmet that the gladiator wore, right? Next one. Soldier. Right? We know that's a, a military helmet. Next one. Pastor Bob, which one's that? It's a football helmet. I'm, I just lost half of the congregation. Next one, please. The Mandalorian, right? Even he wore a helmet. All right, when we see, you could take it out. When we see helmets, we know that they represent something. 
we know that they represent a, a team or an army uh, or, or, or a trade, whatever the case is. The Roman soldiers, they had identifiable helmets. When their enemies saw them, uh, they knew exactly who was marching towards them. And so it is with the helmet of salvation that it identifies us as believers, as followers of Christ. And a soldier of Christ is to be identified with his Savior. 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. It says, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life so that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Mentioning my brother a lot tonight, I should call him. But I remember, my brother, again, I told you he was a Marine, Marine, and he served uh, in the Iraqi Freedom War many years ago. And he doesn't really talk much about it, uh, so whenever he does mention something, I, I, my ears perk up and I want to hear what he has to say. And he was saying that while he was stationed in Iraq, that uh, his fellow Marines would say, Free, why are you so uptight? Why are you on edge? How come you never take your gear off? How come you don't take pictures? How come you don't smile at the people? And his response was, I am not here on vacation. I'm here to do my job and get home and make sure you get home. That's the mindset of a warrior. That's the mindset uh, of someone who is called and enlisted not comfortable, but understands and knows where he's at. He's on the battlefield. And to those in that area, they knew who those Marines were. They knew who those soldiers were because they were identified. They didn't talk. They talked differently. They acted differently. They behaved differently. Their customs were different. They, Individuals, the people in that area knew and understand who they were, that they were Americans. They might have been different ethnicities, different color, male, female, didn't matter. They knew who was stationed there, that these were Americans, that these were U.S. Marines, U.S. soldiers, because they were different, because they, they weren't home. Home was back here. And as Christians, we got to remember that we too are different. We should be different. In 1 Peter 2, 9, the Bible says that we are his own special people, that we belong to God. And throughout human history, God has always marked his people. He's set them aside, set them apart from the world. He's consecrated, made them holy unto himself, uh, fit for his use, uh, for his kingdom. And when People see us, they should understand that we belong to Jesus by the way we live, by the way we speak, by the way we keep a testimony. It's so important that we keep a testimony, that we honor Jesus by the way that we live our lives. Book of Romans, chapter 13, verse 11. 11 through 14. It says, do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is almost over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not carousing and drunkenness, uh, not in sexual immorality, debauchery, not in decession or in jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Saying, put on Jesus. What does that mean? Well, Ephesians 4.24 says, we take off the old self and we put on the new self created in God, in righteous and holiness. In Colossians 3.10, it says again, you put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Our, our identity is found in Jesus, in the one that gave us salvation. And this world right now is so identity obsessed. It's all about individualism. 
it's, it's all about whether it's from pronouns or orientations or subcultures. Uh, everybody wants to be an individual. And if you notice, though, everyone's so busy being an individual that they're really all the same. There's nothing new under the sun. They look just like everyone else. As believers, we identify with Christ. We follow him. We serve him. The more we get to know him, uh, we realize that Jesus Christ isn't just one little aspect of our lives of what makes us up, but Jesus Christ is our life. He is our life. We wake up in the morning thanking Jesus. We go to bed at night uh, thanking Jesus. We should be on our minds. That's just when we need something or we're struggling, but uh, we have a fellowship with him. In John 17, Jesus is praying, verses 14 through 17. He's praying, and he says, I have given them your word. He's talking about his disciples, you and I. He says, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of this world. And we need to stop trying to be part of the world. We're in the world for a reason, to be an influence, to identify us as as born-again believers, uh, to encourage those that might still be lost, might still be blind, might still not know Jesus in a personal way, to be an influence in their lives. And that's why Jesus hasn't taken us home yet, because there's still work to be done whether it's across the street at your neighbor's house or at your job or on the bus sitting next to someone. We're called to be that light and that salt of the earth. The helmet of salvation, what it does, it protects the believer from spiritual death. Remember in the movie Saving Private Ryan? I believe it's the beach scene at the beginning. And they're laying down. And uh, a bullet ricochets off of the soldier's he- helmet. And in amazement, he takes off that helmet, and he looks, and he's like, he sees literally what just took place. And then all of a sudden, boom, that second bullet finds his head. See, he took his helmet off. Just for that split second, it was just enough to uh, let the next bullet find its mark. I was watching... Battle of the Bulge, this uh, documentary about the Battle of the Bulge, and they were showing this particular soldier. You know how they'll show a picture of this of a soldier and where he was stationed, what he was doing? Well, the guy doing the uh, commentating, he had his actual helmet, and uh, he said that the guy was injured in, in that battle, and then he showed the helmet, and he says he, he must have taken a good beating, and he showed the helmet. In the back of the helmet, there's this huge indentation, And he goes, I don't know if that was a bullet that bounced off or if it was some metal that might have hit. He said, but uh, this helmet saved his life. And the helmet of salvation protects us. It protects us from the evil one. It reminds us that we're saved. It reminds us that we're children of God. It reminds us not to quit. It reminds us that we have a hope. His name is Jesus. And we can't deceive ourselves into think that uh, we're okay just taking off the armor, even just for a little while. Armor is heavy. The temptation is to take it off um, because you feel victorious. And that's when the enemy will come in. The Bible says, those who think they stand, take heed that she may fall. Book of Ephesians 6, 10, uh, 13. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. The armor of God is given to the believer so that we can stand our ground. So we can stand our ground in our marriages. So we can stand our ground in our homes. So we can stand our ground. The enemy is a bully. He wants to push the believers around. And God has given us the armor of God so that we can stand against him. We can't do it in and of our own strength. We tried that, and we were bound, and we were in strongholds, but in the armor of God, in the armor of light, when we put on Jesus Christ, uh, 
we can be victorious tonight, church. We're not defenseless. Think about the victory that God has given you in your personal life. Whatever it might have been. It might have been victory over a sickness. It might have been victory over an addiction. It might have been victory over pride and jealousy. God has given you victories. We need to hold on to those victories and stand our ground and not let the enemy take ground back. We are saved from the penalty of our sins, and we're promised eternal life. Heaven is our home, and we wear the helmet of salvation. It means that every day we're focused on what's promised to us, eternity, the hope and future that we have with, with, with Christ. But salvation isn't just about a future reward. Salvation impacts our, our daily life. It impacts our present life. Jesus came, the Bible says, to give us life, and that life in abundantly. And so when we go through struggle, yes, we know that one day, all the struggles that we go through, we're going to be rewarded for that when we're in heaven. But salvation isn't just about one day being in heaven, but it's about right now and what God is doing in our lives right now and what God is changing in our lives and whatever struggle that God is able to work out all things to the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. <laughs> Salvation reminds us that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And as our worship team comes up, John 1, 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. And as the children of God, we have been given promises. We have been given blessings. We have been given access to his throne room, prayer, the ability to talk to God. Prayer doesn't just have to be confined to inside of a sanctuary or an hour before service. Prayer can, is in the morning. When we wake up, prayer is throughout our day. Prayer is when we're struggling with something and we're asking God for wisdom. That ability to enter into the holy of holies, into the throne room of God at any point, at any time, and begin to communicate, fellowship with our Father. He's given us as children of God, He's given us power and authority over the enemy. He says, we've been given the power and authority to trample upon snakes and scorpions. That he's given us this authority that comes in his name. As children of God, we are given grace and mercy. Today, my son called me up and he gave me some bad news. And I said, man, at first I was a little upset and then I realized, ah, you know, I'm guilty of the same thing. I said, it's all right, I'm not upset. And it turned out not to be bad news. Everything got resolved, and, and it's a long story for a different night. Uh, but as a father, um, I, I wasn't upset with my son because it was a mistake. It was an accident, and it was something that could have easily happened to me. And God looks at his children, and he sees when we struggle, and he sees when we sin, and he sees when we fall, and he doesn't excuse it to but he does forgive it when we repent. And he does help us uh, to overcome that so that it's not a stronghold in our lives, so that we don't keep constantly falling to the same thing over and over. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. He gives us grace. He gives us mercy because he's a father who, who loves us. And the penalty of our sin was placed on his son, Jesus Christ. And so if you're in this place and you're feeling condemned because of whatever, Leave it at the altar. Pick up your forgiveness, your salvation. Don't let the devil rob you tonight. See, he's given us his Holy Spirit. That word, the right to become children, that word right means authority, means, means power. He's given us the power and the authority to be called children of God. Salvation, the helmet of salvation, it ultimately reminds us the key thing is that the battle is not ours. 
battle is the Lord's. The battle belongs to God. The victory is God's. He lets us fight from that place of victory. David, as a young shepherd boy, understood this. When he went to the battlefield and saw his brothers and the Israelites cowering because of the Goliath, the giant, and the Philistines. And David understood, uh, it's not by power nor by might, but by my spirit. Uh, this battle is not mine. The battle belongs to God. And he was able to call out that giant in his life. He told that giant, uh, in the name of the Lord God, you're going down. And your head's coming off. God gave David a victory. When he was telling that giant that uh, the battle belongs to God, the battle is the Lord's, uh, you know what? The Philistines heard that. You know who else was hearing that? His brothers in the Israelite army. And when, he, when they saw God give David the victory, they were reminded salvation is of God. The battle is of God. We just got to be faithful to stand in the fight. We just got to be faithful to not quit, not give up, not cower, not shrink, but to keep going forward because if God is for us who can be against us there's a psalm and it talks about God going in front and then covering the rear and that the hand of blessing be upon being upon his head and that's the God that we serve that he goes ahead of us sometimes we don't know where we're walking we're just walking by faith. And sometimes we don't understand what's going on. We're just walking by faith. But God is making that path for us. And you know what else he's doing? Is he's covering our backs. He's watching out for us. And he's making sure that his people are where he wants them to be. In the perfect will, his perfect will. As I end in Romans chapter 8, verses 37, 39. It says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Tonight, the helmet of salvation reminds us there's nothing in this world that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That God loves his people. And you might find yourself in a battle tonight. It's okay. You're not alone. God is with you. Just stay in the fight. Just stay in the fight. Just keep punching and ducking. Stay in the fight. Right, Pastor Reg? Just keep punching and ducking. God loves you tonight. Let's bow our heads uh, in reverence to God with our eyes closed.